my name is Son Yeol uh, from Yonsei University. I uh, am taking uh, the moderating role uh, in this session titled Innovation and Entrepreneurship in Asian Capitalisms. Um, so we have three papers uh, by uh, Professor Gary Harrigal uh, from uh, University of Chicago and uh, another one uh, by Jun Koo Lee and, and Hyunjin Lim. Uh, and uh, Professor Miyajima Hideaki from uh, Waseda University. So first uh, presenter is uh, once again Gary Harrigal from uh, uh, University of Chicago. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, honored to be here at uh, Seoul National University. It's my first visit to South Korea and I'm uh, in particular uh, delighted and uh, I don't know proud uh, parent I have uh, Seoul National has many University of Chicago products on its faculty and two are on this panel uh, uh, Son Yul and uh, and uh, Kwon Hyun Ki and uh, I'm delighted to be able to be here with them uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about um, uh, a research project that I've been involved with for a while and uh, which is now winding uh, down. And um, we're going, I guess, from the, uh, the 50,000 foot perspective of Glenn and uh, uh, the um, question of capitalism, what is it, does it exist, to the granular micro level of, I don't really care if there's capitalism, but look at what's going on here. Uh, level. So um, we have been, uh, we did a study of uh, the globalization of uh, German, and automo German automobile and machinery uh, manufacturing. We're, it's going to be a book uh, <clears throat> next year um, in German with Campus Verlag. Uh, and the, um, the takeoff of the book is that it is really the question not whether or not there is globalization, but that globalization is a fact that is multinationals, German multinationals, are producing massive amounts of things in uh, markets all over the world, and how do they organize this? And what are the consequences of the way in which they organize it for uh, the domestic economy? And uh, <clears throat> so involved in the um, shift is, uh, you know, just some key macro structural factors, lots of growth uh, outside of the developed world that is in Asia in particular, but also in uh, Latin America, but very little growth, slow, uh, arduous, 1% uh, uh, growth, 2% growth, depending on what country you look at in the developed world. And uh, there's also then a shift uh, involved from export to offshore production. So countries like Germany that, uh, in, or Japan that industrialize uh, with a, a export orientation have now uh, not quite shifted from their export orientation, but radically and massively supplemented their exports with offshore production. And I have a, an enormous amount of uh, data that I'm not going to show you. I'll, we'll just go through and I'll, I'll stop at certain slides, which I think are particularly illustrative of the kind of problem that we're dealing with, but it, just to give you a sense of how we approach the problem or the issues that will invo will, are involved in the book and that I'm going to touch on a little bit in the talk today is that uh, in order to organize uh, production on a global scale, multinationals have been redefining their internal governance structures. And so I'm going to talk about how those internal governance structures have been redefined and what they look like. Um, it's also true that uh, the fact that national multinationals like German multinationals or US multinationals or French multinationals or Japan multinationals, Japanese multinationals or South Korean multinationals are globally active has uh, significant recursive consequences for the way in which domestic economic and political uh, economic processes occur in the um, national economy. I'm not going to talk about that stuff so much in this talk. We talk about that in our book um, more, but um, I'm going to talk about the new forms of multinationals and this sort of <clears throat> 
uh, interdependent governance processes. So this presentation has two steps, new distribution of global manufacturing demand and new manufacturing strategies and challenges, um, and then uh, what the new multinationals look like. And so, you know, the step one is the new distribution of global manufacturing demand and new manufacturing multinational strategies. And this is just, you know, if you look at the way in which the, uh, it's helpful to understand the perspective that we adopt. And in, in this talk, the perspective that we adopt is that of a multinational. How do they think about um, the, their market world? Uh, where is growth? Where can we make money? How do we make money? And where is it, where is it most likely to be made? And when they look at the, um, the world, you, they see that uh, growth, in, is, as it's projected by um, uh, people who think about where growth is going to be, is going to be uh, in uh, the non-West. If you look at this, the U.S. is the first uh, non-Western country to be ranked in uh, projected uh, growth, uh, rapid growth rates. So <clears throat> location of demand in the world has shifted away from the developed countries. And this, uh, this is just, you know, the German Chamber of Commerce data. They projected um, a shift in the location of consumers for uh, electronic goods <laughs> uh, in uh, 2006 to 2000, 2001 to 2015, they see a massive shift uh, of purchasers of um, these kinds of household uh, electronics things from um, from the U.S. and Germany and Japan, where there's you know going to be some growth but not much growth to China in a, in a massive way. And this is a just household penetration rates in Germany of uh, electronic goods. This is uh, just to show that if you are a producer of electronic goods, um, there are a lot of people in China who want to buy these, but the um, people in Germany who are going to buy them are uh, small in number. And uh, the growth of demand is mostly a replacement. So this is, I'm not going to go through this, if you look at sector by sector, you see that there's a um, shift in the location of production of capital goods to the, um, to the non-West. And you also, if you look at the uh, structure of demand, you see that the structure of demand has shifted to the non-West. And uh, you know, if you look at <laughs> the growth of demand in for machine tools, uh, you see that uh, the Chinese are gobbling up machine tools and the rest of the, the world is uh, growing uh, in a relatively flat way. And if you look at, this is for passenger cars, this is only till 2020, but the uh, projection is that <clears throat> uh, you know, almost half of the world demand for automobiles will be taking place outside of the, the West. And so if you look not only at China, you see that the production of automobiles inside of China has grown massively and ineluctably, and this is only 2007. The number has uh, doubled since 2007. And uh, if you look at um, offshore production of German passenger cars in 2006 and 2007, you see that China is the, the uh, largest single offshore location for the production of automobiles. Um, you can look at this uh, if you want, but the key Dynamic is this dynamic. This is the production of automobiles by German multinationals. Where do they produce them? Uh, the um, German manufacturers of automobiles produce more automobiles outside of Germany than they produce inside of Germany. So um, if you look at uh, where they do it, China is the, is the place where they do it, but also Brazil, uh, the, um, Spain, the Czech Republic. So there's a lot of production outside of Germany, and there's a lot of production outside the West. And it's not only the Germans. The US is the, the same. General Motors is the same. Uh, the Japanese uh, produce. For some reason, this slide always produces itself in Japanese in the PowerPoint, but it doesn't do it on my computer. But the, this is from uh, 2000 to 2000, I don't know, 2007. And <clears throat> take my word for it, the, the shift is to uh, more production outside of Japan than inside of Japan. Same is true of the French. And what's true is that the global production along the uh, global production, the point I want to make with these, these two slides is that global production is not a shift of uh, simple pr products in the emerging market and sophisticated products in the uh, developed world. The products that are being produced in the emerging markets are as variegated and complex as those that are produced 
inside of the, um, <clears throat> uh, the most developed markets, like the, the, the European and the North American market. So uh, <clears throat> the aim is to either have products with the same quality all over the world or to claim a position in, local mark in the local market that emphasizes the quality of design and manufacture relative to local competitors. Uh, the adaptation to local market tastes and regulations requires the development of engineering, design, and skilled workers' production capability in all markets. So this involves, the claim is, massive upgrading of offshore facilities of multinationals. And it presupposes the dramatic development of capability in these offshore places, say, for example, in China. The sophistication of Chinese manufacturers is um, uh, growing in a, uh, in a massive way. And so these, these two um, slides just show you the, <clears throat> the battle in China is uh, for the mid-range markets. The Germans, if they want to grow, they have to move away from just producing the high-end Mercedes and they have to produce uh, uh, affordable uh, cars that have features that are more sophisticated and more attractive but more uh, uh, reachable financially than their local competitors. Um, it's not only automobiles, it also is, uh, say, for example, Power drives, like if you make a power drive, their power drives are all over the place. They inhabit your life. You have no idea, but they're ubiquitous. If you ride on an escalator, if you go on an elevator, if you have an assembly line, there are these power drives all over the place, and they're made. You can buy the uh, the Mercedes power drive, and you can buy the uh, Yugo power drive. But the um, <clears throat> the battlefield in uh, the um, Chinese market is for the uh, Passat and the uh, Golf power drive. So that's the first part. There's been a shift in the terrain. Multinationals have to react to that shift in terrain. How are they doing it? Um, the uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, problem that they need, the problem that they confront is to main quality, uh, maintain quality uh, worldwide, duplicate product advantages, leverage their central knowledge and designs, but allow for local discretion. They need to take products and adapt them to the um, purchasing power capability, to the supplier quality and supplier capabilities to the uh, regulations. So th there's lots of discretion. Adapt to consumer tastes, accommodate local regulations, adapt to local materials and suppliers, take advantage of variation in production induced by local cost differences. There's a great deal of um, room for creativity in this process of local adaptation. <clears throat> so the, um, the fact that there's um, that great deal of um, pro uh, creativity, room for creativity, makes things extremely uncertain and complex. And if you look at the fact that it's happening across all of the functions of a multinational, the level of uncertainty and the level of complexity is extreme. Uh, so it's a managing and governance problem, how to deal with this kind of uh, uh, complexity. And the, pro the, the, the fact, the, the sort of what the um, multinationals encounter is that traditional incentive alignment-based forms of governance, say, for example, ones that can be understood in principal agent uh, frameworks, don't really uh, help. They don't, they're, it's not possible to set up reliable, reproducible, over time, uh, relevant forms of incentive alignments because there are no fixed role positions, unclear interests, um, which make the alignment of incentives uh, difficult to achieve. There's com competition, technological cost conditions uh, at the center are dramatically different than in the subsidiaries, and the subsidiaries are, are doing all kinds of creative things to try to be able to um, reconcile these cost differences with the quality demands that the center imposes. Um, <clears throat> central changes made without the input of local actors take a long time to implement, so the idea is that you need to create more, uh, how do you say you need to create closer forms of uh, exchange and uh, collaboration between the local and the center that don't align themselves well to fixed uh, incentive structures. Uh, <clears throat> there are other reasons uh, to not believe in the principal agent model in this context, and I'm just going to let you look at that and then go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> the um, solution that we think is emerging, or one, one solution that we think is emerging is um, what we um, refer to as a sort of uh, 
experimentalist system. The, you, you have more cooperation across hierarchies and locations. Iterative, iterative, iterative joint goal setting uh, seems to be more effective in this kind of setting. Uncertainty leads to mutual dependence between the center and the local uh, players within the MNC. Um, the emergent solution is being incorporated within so-called corporate production systems. Every multinational manufacturing multinational today uh, has its own corporate production system. That was the origin of the notion of a corporate production system comes from Toyota and the Toyota manufacturing system, but all of these uh, manufacturers today have embraced and adapted that kind of uh, bottom, like toe to head system of uh, uh, governance based on interdependent stakeholder involvement principles, joint goal setting, regular performance review, ongoing optimization and recomposition of the goals through uh, the setting of goals and the observation of the results and then recursive return to what the aim of the uh, uh, project was to begin with, formal communication, transparency, writing things down, taking pictures, regular meetings, review optimization. So yesterday we had a talk about the transfer of business practices from the um, Korean and Japanese context to the Chinese context and they were very focused on uh, the invisible and uh, in, our, uh, in our research we see that the, um, the systems that they're creating are making an effort to make the invisible explicit and obvious to the practitioners so that they can optimize those things and so that they can, they can uh, change them. And so, you know, there are all these kinds of business practices, Six Sigma, um, uh, lean production that involve uh, the creation of benchmarks, metrics, gates, tools for the identification of problems and inducing uh, collective reflection on joint practices. So um, our caveat is just that this, um, <clears throat> we think that this is a general trend, but in small and medium-sized firm contexts, you, they, there's no kind of little Gebruder uh, Schmidt uh, uh, corporate production system. They do things in a more informal uh, way. They don't uh, codify their own uh, their own practices, but they do engage in this sort of uh, in interdependent legibility creation mechanisms, formal CPSs. And uh, I'm going to talk about the obstacles to diffusion of it in a second. But the 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 sort of formal structure of the um, process that we're describing, the governance structure that we're the governance architecture that we're describing, has a sort of pragmatic uh, experimentalist logic. There are uh, global products and uh, standards around those products that are established uh, at the center, often in, uh, in dialogue with um, uh, local players. Um, the, um, the product and the standards are handed off to the local uh, location, say, you know, the um, Falve production facility in Shanghai. There's a mega amount of local adaptation that occurs by increasingly skilled engineers and workers at the Shanghai location. They have to justify to uh, Wolfsburg why they're making these uh, adaptations to the um, product. And then um, through explicit regular uh, uh, meetings of, uh, you know, that are uh, preordained and written into the sort of schedule, they have to sort of account for how the central standard relates to the local product and then the, the innovations that occur at the, in the local uh, place can be incorporated into the, um, into the central standard and, or can be allocated to other production locations, including the home market production location. So you have, as a result, constant optimization <coughs> and recomposition of the targets and the practices, formally induced group self-analysis at all levels of the MSC, and uh, the creation of a global system of interdependent recursive organizational learning is our claim. And, um, you know, we uh, describe it in a great deal of detail in the, uh, in the paper, but um, we have noticed that there are three characteristic obstacles to the diffusion of these kinds of systems. Uh, <clears throat> hierarchical insulation, uh, managerial egoism, you know, Glenn, uh, you know, the financial uh, uh, part of any multinational can be really egoistic and impose unilaterally its goals on the manufacturers. and that is disruptive to the process of uh, collaborative uh, interaction and joint uh, problem goal setting. And uh, <clears throat> there's a, 
there's a lot of uh, concern about that kind of managerial hierarchical installation. But it can be not only finance, it can be all kinds of barriers between the different uh, functions. You can also have um, processes of stakeholder exclusion. Stakeholder participation is crucial to the um, collaboration and also to the making of all of the invisible tacit understandings of that that make production work ex explicit in the, uh, in the collaborative process. If stakeholders exclude themselves, then that can be uh, disruptive to the process of knowledge flow. So in, in, uh, <clears throat> in Germany, there are uh, factions within trade unions and factions within firms that view the emergent, the construction of all of this team-based governance and joint production, joint goal setting as a sort of threat to the principles, the established institutions of co-determination and uh, self-governance in the, uh, the corporation. And so they can uh, resist the um, practices of the corporate production system. And then there are also there are inadequate empowerment resources for the participants. Low skills uh, can uh, make it difficult for um, the people at the, okay, I'm going to finish, uh, at the lowest level to participate in the um, process. So there are these kinds of characteristic obstacles. Our point is that firms notice this. And so they have been erecting a whole array of um, counter-revolutionary, or, or um, <clears throat> how do you say, like there's an attack on the counter-revolution. There are, there are revolutionary cadres being created inside of multinationals to smash the um, resistors, the, um, the hierarchy insulators, the stakeholder excluders, and the inadequate empowerment people by, um, they create organizations. There are um, centers of competence, continuous improvement teams. There are um, these kinds of cookbooks, which are really fascinating devices that are uh, uh, pictures of every stage in the production process that make the whole entire production process legible that uh, the center gives to the local and then the local tries to implement it and the local has to um, do it or explain why they can't do it. And so it creates a, uh, an explicit process of uh, mutual recognition and self-justification uh, on, um, on the local player. So, <coughs> There's a whole set of problems about what happens if you have a dispute, and uh, uh, there is an interesting uh, system of penalty defaults that have been emerging about how to reconcile uh, the disputes that might emerge in a collaborative process of joint goal setting. And the point about penalty defaults is that <clears throat> they don't uh, impose solutions, but they redefine the terrain of collaboration so that the collaboration can uh, overcome its blockage, but not. Um, so that uh, the center imposes a solution on the uh, thing. But the point is that, uh, as a result, uh, there's a kind of perpetual revolution going on inside of multinationals today, uh, where the um, point is to destabilize entrenched, insulated, self-excluding kinds of processes and to um, uh, manufacture or create the conditions for uh, uh, continuous uh, joint goal setting and problem solving, which over time results in the continuous redefinition and recomposition of the terrain upon which uh, manufacturing and uh, production takes place. And so the, um, the key thing that we think is that permanent disruption fosters learning and innovation within the entire, within the entire organization. The, um, the institutions that, uh, that foment disruption are as crucial to the process as the um, institutions that are designed to foster collaboration and uh, joint problem solving. So, thank you.